and freedom, or freedom in film software. Thanks, Andrew. Check. Oh, sorry. Rookie mistake, I forgot to unmute the mic. All right. So uh, Glass Wings is my partner, Dr. Catherine Phelps, and I um, doing arts-related things. Um, we have a couple of other trading names for tech-related things, but this is our arts-related organisation. Um, Ananasi Spaceworks, Ananasi Spaceworks, I should say, sorry, um, is Terry and Rosalind's uh, organisation. Um, they uh, have done most of the work I'll be talking about today. Um, and... Uh, Anansi, of course, is an African myth which is possibly somewhat better known now because uh, Neil Gaiman has, uh, has referenced it in his fiction. Um, so um, Terry's background is that he actually was an astronomer, so he's always had an interest in space, and so he wanted to um, uh, produce some uh, fiction based on space um, and do some, uh, some animation, and he of course, is a long-time supporter of open source as well, and so he thought this was a good opportunity to see where the uh, where features are still missing and where uh, the, the tool set can be filled out a bit. So uh, that's just, I uh, will probably even, uh, if there's time, I'll probably give a lightning talk later on about other people who are doing similar things. I think we should encourage everybody who's, who's uh, producing art using free and open source tools and finding where are, the, where are the missing bits that we can fill out. I think there's a very valuable... Um, way of supporting our community is to actually do real projects using these tools and see what, what, can, we, uh, what can we extend. Um, so um, uh, Terry and Rosalind have done most of the work, um, but there are a lot of other people who have contributed to this project as well. Uh, I haven't given credits for everybody who's done you know, background art and modelling and stuff because that's all on the websites that are linked. Um, and we'll stick to the core stuff. So Film Freedom is the project to actually make filmmaking possible with free software. Um, and uh, there's a lot of aspects to that. But in particular, when you're not just doing a, a small one-off thing, a lot of people have already made free and open source films. The, the Blender project in particular, and this project does use Blender. The Blender project has released, regularly released a number of quite impressive movies, starting with short ones and going on to longer ones. So Big Buck Bunny and Elephant's Dream or whatever it's called. And there's a, there's a, there's a whole range of them that have come out from Blender. But those are individual movies. And what uh, Terry wanted to do was to actually... Uh, his story is actually longer than that, and so it's, it's planned to be a TV series. And uh, so there's a lot of work involved in that, and you very quickly realise that uh, the bigger the project gets, the more tools you need to actually make it possible to manage that, particularly if it extends out to large numbers of contributors, long periods of time, and the longer the time gets, the more contributors you get coming and going. So there starts to be all these other things you need beyond just the core of the tool that actually does the animation. And so that's partly what we're going to be talking about. Um, so um, this is not just about animation. The Film Freedom Project is also, um, live animation filmmaking is also in scope, um, even though the initial sample movie, Lunatics, is actually an animated movie. 
Um, Terry has done some live action work with uh, compositing and effects and stuff, and uh, the, the intention is very much to support live action filmmakers as well, even though this talk is mostly about animation. Uh, so there are a couple of components that Terry's been working on. One of them is this thing called KitKat. So uh, the purpose of KitKat is that um, when you have a large project, you start to need digital ad asset management. That's what DAM stands for, Digital Asset Management System. Um, there is a quite popular and widely used digital asset management system called Tactic, uh, which is, is uh, extensively used and is available in both. Uh, they opened it up um, a few years ago, um, and there is both a, a commercial and an open source version. Uh, however, what it doesn't do in and of itself, what Tactic does not do, is uh, integrate with popular free and open source tools, and that's what KitKat is for. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I've done these three components both in alphabetical order and also in order, I think, perhaps of least interesting to most interesting, so that uh, we'll save the best bits for the end. So briefly talking about Tactic. Um, so uh, Tactic is, um, uh, gives you workflow logic. It gives you database and file system management. Um, so it's for tracking the creation and development of digital assets through your production pipelines. So in the movie making process, you will at the very least have your actual video clips and audio clips, but you could quite possibly have a lot of other stuff. For live action uh, uh, films, you probably have things like location scouting, uh, tracking your props, continuity issues. For animation, you have, of course, um, uh, 3D models perhaps, uh, character models, um, backgrounds, textures, huge amount of assets. Uh, in any project. The bigger the project, the more assets. And uh, you can't really rely on just sticking them all in a folder and hope you don't lose anything. You eventually do need some kind of system to track them. So uh, Tactic is a good choice because it has an open source version available. Um, it started in 2005 in the CG community um, for people doing visual effects and animation and post-production and even video game studios. Uh, but then in 2012, it was open sourced, uh, apparently encouraged by things like Red Hat and, and Blender. Um, so it's under the uh, OSI-approved Eclipse public license and is written almost entirely in Python. And it lets you organise your digital files using uh, metadata like the name, the file type, the date, the project, the producer. Um, it provides automatic file naming conventions so that uh, when you save things, they can be, the, the, you don't have to try and come up with names, they can be named in a way that you can actually find it again later. Uh, and also supports event triggering so that um, you can not only do the consistent naming, but also store things in consistent locations. So uh, this is really quite a useful tool. And uh, I'm going to skip through these fairly quickly because I said this is the boring part. But you've got your workflow management. Um, you've got your file system management. Um, and also includes you know, librarian functions, checking in, check out, versioning. So if you have a large number of people working on your project, you want to be able to support um, keeping track of who's currently working on a particular part of the system. Um, you might, of course, you might want versioning for things. Um, and finally, you have data management. Um, so it's not just files. You can also support um, databases and files and databases. So if you have um, other things that you're storing, like, uh, as I've seen, information about location scouting, information about your cast, uh, soundtracks with translations, uh, voiceovers, um, uh, anything like that that potentially is not just files but might also include data in a database, that can also all be handled and tracked. So that's what Tactic does. What KitKat does is it actually uh, integrates with popular open source tools. So uh, this is the part that Terry wrote. This is done using uh, Python and Qt and using the plugin interface in the existing open source tools. So. Um, we can actually do this, it's pretty cool. Um, so for example, Blender has an extension mechanism, and so you can actually uh, have a Blender plugin that when you go to save your content or load content from Blender, you can actually have that tracked through the asset management system. And the same with other tools like Ardor, and um, I don't want to do that. Let's just zoom out again. Um, and um, uh, Krita and uh, potentially other tools, Inkscape and, and um, all the different open source tools that people typically would use when creating, uh, creating videos or movies or animation. So that's 
going to be a valuable component that was really a missing component. Um, it's not completed because Terry's primary focus is really on actually producing his movie, um, but he's done some good work on it, and of course it's all open source, and so other people are encouraged to contribute. Um, there are some mock-ups for parts of how this would work. So you can see there that that's a, an example of how you might have a, a window that's integrated into the application and that uh, lets you track stuff. And it goes beyond that because you might also have a window for things like discussion as well, where you, when you have multiple people working on a project, there might be some discussion information and that might be stored with the assets as well, so you can see what the, the thoughts around how that asset will be used. So that's probably more than enough about Tactic and KitKat. That's the boring part. Let's move on to some less boring stuff. Um, so Libre, which is a rather cute uh, pun, was inspired by um, how, would, how would you release this stuff? And yes, I know these days most stuff is released online, um, but in fact it's kind of important to have some kind of, of storage format. Uh, in fact, one of the big problems we have now is with the, the rise of streaming video services is that there's no guarantee that they maintain things and keep things available. Um, Disney, for example, is notorious for having the so-called Disney vaults where they um, put things back in the Disney vaults, by which they mean they have a period of time in which they choose not to make their content available. Um, they figure that people will pay more for it if it's scarce, and so the way to do that is to have artificial scarcity. So their great classic uh, animated movie titles will be available for a couple of years and then not be available for a decade and then be available again and then not be available again. And so they actually pull things off intentionally. And um, this is the case now with, uh, with pretty much all content available on streaming video services that um, as people argue about who's, who's going to put it on which services, they fragment into more and smaller services. You know, you used to be able to get lots of stuff on Netflix and then people pulled it off because they wanted it for their own service that they've launched. Uh, and there's no guarantee that things will remain available long term. So... There's real value in having a physical storage format. If there's something you want to keep and have access to, um, actually having it, uh, you know, even if you can just have a copy that you can store on your own hard drive, that's good too. If it's available under some kind of Creative Commons license or something, that's nice. Um, but ideally a format that is suitable not just for computer playback, but also for playback on hardware devices. So the DVD standard is not too bad in that regard. Uh, the Blu-ray standard is terrible because the Blu-ray standard has all kinds of, um, of um, intentional misfeatures uh, region codes, digital restrictions management, um, uh, uh, support for encrypted uh, video streams, support for downgrading the quality of the video image if you don't meet the requirements. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Blu-ray. Not only that, but you can't even implement Blu-ray without buying an expensive license. It's not open in any way. Um, so thankfully, Blu-ray hasn't really caught on to the same degree that DVD has because it came just a little bit too late and the streaming stuff had already become popular. But um, that was what inspired Terry to create Libray as a kind of a alternative to Blu-ray. Um, so um, his thinking was uh, to, you can put it on a disc, obviously, on a data, data disc of some sort, but he was thinking as a distribution format to use SD cards, because SD cards are still widely supported and open, and you can um, use them without any kind of uh, issues around encryption or whatever, and they come in reasonably large capacities these days. And then on those SD cards, you would put a file of a standard format, which, of course, you don't need the physical SD card. You could just distribute the files. Um, currently looking at Matroshka with VP8 or VP9 and FLAC and HTML5 for menus and subtitles and things like that. Um, so, again, this is um, a proposed free and open source standard for distributing video. Um, anyone's welcome to join in and comment on that. Um, there are, of course, lots of standards for distributing video already. The point of this again, is to have something that supports all the features that you get from a commercially sold video. So not just slap your video up on, uh, on, a, on a streaming site like YouTube, but how do you handle having 20 languages or 50 languages um, included there with audio and subtitles? How do you support interactives with, and with you know, interactive menus and overlays and all those kinds of things which are not currently well supported by the existing standards? And again, those things don't stay static either. YouTube has disabled a number of the interactive features. If you ever used one of the um, Choose Your Own Adventure style branching YouTube videos, most of those don't work anymore now because YouTube has disabled in-video links. Uh, so again, having, a, having this standard I think is useful. It, uh, it, it may seem like it's not something we urgently need, but I think it, it, there's some value in it. All right, so moving on. The most interesting part, this is the actual movie. So... Um, the idea Terry had was to do a um, fairly hard science fiction story about the first permanent settlers on the moon. 
Um, and of course, he's using all open tools. Um, and it's an uh, independent free culture project. This actually started in 2011. There was the first Kickstarter, which raised funds for the initial preparatory pre-production work. So that involved things like character designs and um, uh, modeling, both of the characters and of uh, a lot of the other assets. Um, and so that work was finished by about 2013. Um, and then there was a second Kickstarter, which uh, was not successful. He was asking for 42,000 US dollars and only got 2,000 because running a Kickstarter is hard. Um, you need to work really hard to promote it and to get people interested. And the more niche what you're doing is, the harder it is to actually get support. So like a lot of people who do failed Kickstarters, he was like, well, I'll just do it myself. And then you just do it the slow way where you do all the hard work and it takes longer. Um, so that's been going since 2013, which is quite a while, and he's been churning away. Um, had this Kickstarter succeeded, he might have been able to have the first episode out in maybe two years. As it is, he's um, six years down the track and still hasn't got the first episode out, although it's coming together quite nicely. Um, but uh, that's what happens when you do it on the smell of an oily rag in your spare time. Um, so, of course, if anyone wants to join in on this, um, it's, it's all open. All the content will be available, and uh, that's a great thing uh, because people will be able to remix and reuse it if they want to. It's all under the Creative Commons share-alike license. So that's all good. And I think we should support more creators doing that. Oh, I've skipped to the end. Didn't mean to do that. That's a useful slide, which you can look at later. But let's go back to where we were, which is that slide. Great. OK. Um, so um, I'm using reveal.js for this presentation, another great open source product. Uh, let's see. So next slide. So here's what I've contributed. Um, I was very kindly gifted these two Dell rack mount servers, and actually the tower server as well. They all came from my employer, InfoExchange, who's a non-profit. Um, we don't anymore, but we used to run a thing called Green PC, where we actually refurbished our computers and uh, um, provided them to people who otherwise couldn't afford one. Um, and in this case, uh, these were surplus to requirements. The um, rack mount servers down there um, used to be used uh, in our data center, but they have the distinct disadvantage that they have physical hard drives in them. And nobody wants that in a data center now. You want SSDs because not only are they quite a lot faster, but very importantly, they use a lot less electricity and generate less heat. And that's really a limiting factor in data centers these days. Um, there are actually data centers now where I'm told that you cannot fill all the racks because you will not be able to get enough electricity into the data center to power all the things that go into those racks because as computers get smaller and smaller, you can actually fit more computing power into the same racks and you unfortunately can't get enough electricity and cooling to make it work. Um, so certainly hard drives are not popular. So these were gifted to me. Um, and uh, the top one has 144 gig of RAM and the bottom one has 72 gig of RAM. Um, and they're dual uh, quad core Xeon. They're not cutting edge, but they're not bad. And Terry was planning to rent some AWS time to do his rendering, but um, I offered to let him have this and I'm paying for the electricity at my house. I have solar panels, so that helps. Yes? Oh, yeah. No, that's, uh, it's just in my laundry. Um, but actually, this um, cupboard that you're seeing there um, is an early and really quite solid IKEA TV cabinet, um, back when they actually had fairly solid ones that got discontinued and replaced with cheaper model. And this one was the last one in the shop that was a demo one, and I had to pay a guy 50 bucks to put it in a trailer and bring it around to my house because it was already assembled. Um, so for many years, it, it had a TV in it. Um, I had a like, full-size, massive, great big CRT TV in it, and when I switched to a flat-screen TV, I didn't need this cabinet anymore. Yes? No, no. Um, if anyone breaks into my house, I've got a problem. Um, but uh, anyway, who, who wants to cut an incredibly heavy and, and obsolete uh, rack mount Dell? Nobody. Um, that, would be, that would be crazy. Um, they're like, um, you know, it's got all the two people bend at the knees instructions all over it, you know, because it's whatever it is, 20-something kilos, however much it is. Um, so out of shot there, um, uh, this is before I plugged it in, but it's plugged in now. Out of shot um, down below, I've got a 900-watt UPS. Up above, you can just see um, to the right, that UPS is powering the firewall um, and the um, NBN modem that's up on top of the cupboard. And I have a, um, I got some electricians to install a, a proper... Um, a proper comms rack in my laundry because you know everyone needs a proper comms rack. 
and it's got a 24-port gigabit switch in it and goes to sockets all around the house because, you know, I reckon that adds value to the house. <laughs> Um, and actually, it made a huge difference to my um, internet performance as well. Previously, when I was using the old in-house telephone wiring that came with the house in the 60s or 70s or whenever the house was built, uh, my performance um, was on the ADSL and subsequently on the NBN VDSL. I'm still on copper. Um, the performance was something like uh, 12 megabits down and two up. And it turns out redoing the house wiring fresh and putting in proper you know, patch panels and cabling and stuff meant I went to 40 megabits down and, um, and something like 12 up. And then more recently, when they redid the street wiring as well, I've gone to 49 to 50 down, which is the rated, actual rated speed of the MBN connection, uh, and close to 19 or 20 up, which is, again, the rated speed. So it's actually, amazingly, I'm one of the few people who seems to have a full-speed MBN connection, but only because I actually have brand-new fresh wiring in the house and they actually fix the wiring in the street. So... Um, yeah, so that's quite nice. It uh, means you can actually transfer files back and forth at a reasonable speed. Um, so the reason that uh, this turns out not to be a terrible idea is because um, when rendering frames with Blender, it can do um, about a frame every two minutes at high resolution. I think he's doing 4K or something like this. So one frame every two minutes means it hardly troubles the disk drives. So that's good because the disks are not great. And in fact, the, um, this has been sitting around long enough that the, um, the RAID batteries died, so it now doesn't have proper write-through, which is also worse for the drives. I've ordered some more from China, but you know, in the meantime, the disk performance is not great, but it's hardly exercising the disks, which is nice, because it means it turns out that a lot of the power draw and heat that these rack mount units, uh, at least half is the drives. Because even when this thing is churning away with 16 threads rendering full speed and using you know, most of the RAM and all of the CPU, it's only drawing something like 400 watts out of a maximum of 900. Um, the rest of it would be if the drives were working hard, which they're not, which is good, because this is, you know, you can hear this and you don't want to hear it any louder, otherwise we'd have trouble sleeping. So um, that's all very exciting. The pedestal fan is there for the summer, um, just in case I've, I've got a big hole at the back of the cabinet there and we can blow the air a bit more forcefully with the pedestal fan if we really need to in the middle of summer. Um, someone did a study and found out that the data centres um, temperature isn't as critical as people thought it was. You don't actually have to keep the gear really, really cool. If you just keep it sort of not, not actually overheating too badly, then it's not actually all that awful. So the inside of that, um, that wooden cabinet, normally that door is closed, and the inside of that wooden cabinet is probably around 36 degrees, which is cool enough for it not to catch fire. And the, um, the uh, hard drives are probably running at 45 degrees, something like that. It's fine. You don't need to have air conditioning and keep it at 22 degrees. It really, it really doesn't matter. So that's probably more than enough of that. Let's play a clip now. This is a trailer, the third trailer, and a preview of episode one. And we'll give you an idea of what this project actually looks like. The colonization of the moon is not just a government's decision or even a society's decision. It is a personal one. I knew then that if there were going to be colonists on the moon that I would have to be one of them. So you really think that the moon is the best place for a child? I think that the best place for a child is with her parents. This is not a decision that we took lightly or without thought. We evaluated everything. We created custom spacesuits, redesigned spaces in the launch vehicle. A massive amount of design work has gone into making sure that Georgie will have the safest trip possible. So that's the uh, most recent trailer and gives you an idea of, uh, of what can be achieved with a few years of hard work. It's coming along quite nicely. Um, I'm actually in a minute, um, I'm actually going to play a full uh, five minute clip of the, the longest consecutive segment of the first episode that's actually been more or less finished. Um, but before I do that, um, I kind of went fairly quickly through, how much time have I got left? 
Not much? Okay, well then maybe I won't. I was going to say, if people want me to, um, to uh, go back to any of the things I kind of um, skipped through quickly, I could do that. But let's not. Let's, let's play the, um, the, the final clip because it's five minutes and we'll, let's do that. Uh, I've got five minutes? Perfect. Let's do that. So what I'll do um, is I'll actually... Just a sec. I want to do this absolutely full, full screen rather than in the frame. So let's, let's see if I remember how to do that. Uh, so if I do that and then I go... Exit full screen there, and then, so I don't want this little frame around the edge of it. Let's try if I go back into full screen now. There we go, perfect. So let's play that. So this is a test render, so you'll see it's actually still got, um, it's still got some things that are incomplete. And it's got time code. Little plug for Big Buck Bunny there, if you saw that on one of the posters. <laughs> and the Marevna project, another free and open source film project. See some stuff still needs to clean up like that black line there. You'll notice there's an intentionally slightly cartoony look. The, uh, the black line edges, that's an aesthetic choice. This question is for Mrs. Lerner. How long did you plan to go into space? Well, I suppose since the first day I met my husband, Robert Lerner. I attended one of his lectures and I realized that the colonization of the moon is not just a government's decision or even a society's decision. It is a personal one. I knew then that if there were going to be colonists on the moon, that I would have to be one of them. So, Robert Lerner and yourself sounds like an amazing love story. Care to enlighten us? <laughs> Perhaps another time. Did you always plan to take your children with you to the moon? No, actually. Our plan was to go to the moon and have children there. Alone on the moon? Weren't you afraid? Afraid of what? Complications. With birth or pregnancy. Running out of diapers. I guess we supposed that we would get by. And let me take this moment to say that what we are doing, taking our daughter to the moon, is no different than what colonists have always done. When the first immigrants went to colonize the Americas, it was by no stretch of the imagination safe. But people took their families with them. You cannot start a new culture, a new society, with only single men and women. We need families to make settlements, and that means children. Sukiwa この決断を軽い決めてくではありません。あらゆる方向から判断して決断してのです。宇宙用の服、車の中、またらしく世間を押しました。全ては常時が安全に飛びをするためです。正直、この旅はジョージを毎日学校へ送り迎えするより安全な
What are your thoughts about the flight? I'm looking forward to it. Little Georgiana is like a little niece to me. It's wonderful to think that I can Unfortunately, show his, her uh, Unfortunately, his mouth movements, the animation channel got muted well, accidentally. Well, I can see that our So it'll have to be re-rendered. Good luck on your flight and know that all of our hopes and dreams go with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgie. Thank you all so much. So there's obviously no um, background music or anything on this, but uh, but yeah, that's that's nearing nearing completion that segment of the film. So yeah, I forgot to mention that um, one of the reasons to uh, to even bother with the old servers was because um, Terry did try rendering this on his own desktop machine initially, and it turns out that. Um, some of the scenes that are quite complex, the individual frames are sometimes as much as um, 8 to 10 gig of RAM to render. So on a desktop machine, you can't use all the cores because you haven't got enough RAM. So it turns out the, the large quantity of RAM in that machine was the real advantage. So that's it. Um, and um, there are the links to the things I've talked about. And as I said, I hopefully if, I, if I've got time and if there's a slot available, I'll do a bit of a lightning talk later on today about the general concept of supporting people who are doing arts using free and open source. Thank you.